it's time to start. Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Lawson. I'm with uh, Penn State Altoona. Uh, my name is Rusty Myers, and I'm with Penn State uh, University Park. And we're here to talk to you about uh, BASH and uh, BASH in a nutshell. So uh, BASH started in uh, 1989 by Brian Fox is a uh, command interpreter. Um, it interprets commands that you give it and executes them. Uh, there's a kernel, which is kind of the core OS of the Mac, and then the shell is the outer layer of the OS that interacts between the kernel and the hardware. Uh, and Bash lives as a binary under bin Bash, and it's responsible also for spawning subshells of the Bash. All right, so if you guys want to open up your terminal, uh, and you can follow along, we're going to run through some uh, exercises. Basically, the first half, we're going to introduce uh, just some basic commands to your terminal, get you comfortable using that, and then we'll work into scripting. Uh, if you don't know where your terminal app is, it's located in the Applications folder under Utilities. Um, some uh, various examples of commands. Uh, man, which is uh, your help manual. Uh, CP for copy. Uh, make dir for creating new directories uh, slash folders, um, mv for moving, chmod, which is uh, for changing permissions, changing mode, uh, install command, shutdown. All right, so we're going to take some GUI processes to the terminal, but first let's start with the syntax of the command. So we have the uh, ls hyphen la uh, tilde desktop, so we're going to break this down. Uh, the ls part would be the command or utility. Um, this is the list files or directories command. So we come in to the options or flags with the hyphen dash la. Uh, we're actually running two options here. Um, the hyphen l is list in long format, and the hyphen a is include directories and hidden entries, right? So anything that would have a dot in front of it would be a hidden folder or hidden directory. Um, tilde slash desktop is the argument. Uh, so basically, this is which directory we want to be uh, pulling the information from. Um, just kind of a little note here, tilde is a shortcut for the home directory. And another little reminder is that some options or flags can also have arguments depending on the command you're running. Useful tips. There's that tilde again, shortcut for home directory. Uh, tab complete. So if you guys want to type tilde slash des, and hit tab, you'll see that it'll complete to uh, desktop for you. Uh-oh. Wrong way. There we go. I hit the wrong button. Um, up, down arrow, so you can use these to toggle through your previous commands in that session. Uh, exclamation mark command will read your history and run the most recent mm -hmm. command that's matched to that command. Uh, double exclamation mark will run the last command. Control L or Command K uh, will clear a terminal window. And then the last shortcut we wanted to put in here is uh, Control C. That's going to stop current processes. All right, so some useful commands. So let's start by uh, taking a look at the man command, right? So go ahead and type in man and ping. And you should see the manual for all the stuff associated with the ping command. You can use your up arrows to go up and down within the man pages as well to view the text. So we're going to do another one here. You're going to do escape uh, then to get out oh of the Oh, yes, man. thank you. Jumping the gun. All right. So the next uh, command we're going to run is the ping command. And we're going to give it a hyphen C option. Um, and this is a, an option that requires an argument, so we're going to put five after that. So basically, it's going to give you uh, five pings, um, or count two five, and you're going to go ahead and ping the uh, Apple website. And one thing you'd be looking for here would be uh, watching for transmitted and received uh, packets and uh, packet loss. Ping is very helpful if you're not sure you have a good network connection or you're not sure a client is up it is awake, if it's sleeping, uh, sometimes ping will wake it up. If you need to make sure the server is responding, you can ping it. Um, if you need to run a script that needs network access, you can ping before you run it to make sure that you're on the network. And another valuable tool for checking uh, network status would be uh, ifconfig. 
So if you guys want to go ahead and type that in, you'll see lots and lots of information. IFconfig will print out all of your interface information. And, and majority of the interfaces you have will probably be uh, empty. But your primary interface, EN0 for your airport, or EN1, depending on if you have a built-in uh, Ethernet port, you should see a, an IP address and a subnet mask active on that. Um, it's helpful sometimes if you need to just to check to make sure your machine's getting an IP address and that you're not sitting on a 169 IP, or if you need to pull out what subnet you're on. All right, so directories. So directories are basically a, a folder uh, in the GUI. Um, so we're going to do a printing or a print your working directory. So please type in the PWD command. This is going to tell you where you're currently working out of. And then we're actually going to use the uh, CD change directory command um, and go ahead and type in users, uh, dollar sign user in all caps in desktop. Um, dollar sign user in all caps is an environmental variable built in to uh, bash. And so we're accessing that there um, as a basically a shortcut for the users. Or that, user. that would be the uh, current logged in user. Yes, thank you. All right, and then once you're done with that, you would go ahead and type in PWD again, and you should see that we are now working out of the user's uh, user home folder desktop. All right, creating directories. We're going to use the make dir command. Um, so go ahead and start with uh, creating a uh, directory on your desktop. We're going to call it test1. If I'm moving too fast, throw something at me, <laughs> like the catch box. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not typing. Like we did all this you know, pre. So uh, all right, so next we're going to create a directory structure, and we're going to include all parent directories. So we're going to offer the hyphen p option here. Um, this would be very important, because if you didn't do this, we would actually have a failure on this task, or, um, on this command. Uh, basically because test2 does not exist. So we would be trying to create test3 in a directory that's not there. So by adding the hyphen p option, it's creating all parent directories that are needed. And the last one we're going to look at is actually adding an m option as well, or a dash m. Um, so the last one we're doing is uh, another make dir hyphen pm. Uh, again, this is an option that requires an argument, so we're adding in uh, 777. Um, what this is going to do is take test 3 and make it wide open to everybody, uh, so all users would have read, write, and executable access. Just on test 3, though, test 1 and test 2 would still be locked down. And if you guys want, you can check out a on your desktop and see that the folder has been created and all that jazz. Go back one. Okay. You guys good? All right. So now we're going to make a file, right? We're going to use the touch command here. And uh, basically, touch is going to touch a file if, if it exists. It uh, should just what, alter the timestamp. That's about Mod it. Yep. Modification time. And uh, if it doesn't exist, it's going to create that file for you. So what we're doing here is we're creating uh, the test.txt file inside your test1 folder on your desktop. And then we're going to want to read that file, right? So we're going to use a concatenate, or the cat command. And if you type this in, you should get a blank line because there is nothing in that file yet. And we're about to change that. So now we're going to append the word, or words, hello world, uh, into test.txt using the echo command. So you're going to go ahead and type uh, echo hello world. 
We're going to use the double carrots, uh, two greater than symbols um, that will append uh, the text to the file. Um, a single carrot overwrites the file. And so when all is said and done, we'll try another read command here. And we'll use the less command. And uh, when you go ahead and type in this path, uh, you should see hello world exists now on that text file. And when you're typing in those paths, don't forget to try and use tab to autocomplete them. Ah, uh, yes. It'll save you time. And then uh, to escape out of less, you would just have to hit Q. Less is a nice command if you have large files you want to look at it. Loads things into the buffer uh, and, and chunks. Everybody good to move to the next section? All right. All right. So now we're going to look at moving files and directories, right? So we've created some directories. We've created a file in there. Let's move stuff around. So we're going to use the move command. What we're going to do is we're going to move that test.txt file that's nested in test1 into the test3 folder that we've created, or test3 direct directory, um, located inside of test2, inside of test1 on your desktop. So by now, you might have noticed that the, the spaces are kind of the separators for the arguments. So we, we're starting with the mv command, and then where we have two arguments here separated by spaces. The first one is the source file, and the second one is the destination location. Sorry, I thought I'd take a time to swig some water. All right, so we're going to move a single directory here, right? So what we're doing now is taking this test3 uh, directory and putting it on the desktop, pulling out des uh, test2. So yeah, we're using the mv command again. And the tilde command again, or tilde shortcut. So once you guys do this, if you look at your desktop, you should now see the test1 folder there and test3 as well. And we're going to show you that you can actually rename uh, a directory or file using the move command uh, as well, again. <laughs> um, so this time we're taking a test2 that's inside test1 on your desktop, and we're renaming it to test4 uh, inside test one on your desktop. Anything else you want to add to that? No, that's good. All right. Everybody good? Deleting old files. All right, so here we're going to delete one file. Uh, so we're going to use the remove command, or rm. Um, so we're going into the users folder. Uh, that would be current logged in users directory. Uh, into library preferences. And we're going to be grabbing the com.apple.safari.plist file. Don't worry if you delete it. Um, it will come back when you reopen Safari. <laughs> or it should. <laughs> <laughs> There's also, uh, if you'd like to, you can use the cp command and pass two arguments to copy that file to your desktop. Ah, there you go. And then delete it. Um, something to keep in mind when using the rm command, uh, it does not store the directory or file in the trash can for you to uh, be able to restore it easily. Um, it removes the file completely, so be mm -hmm. cautious. Yeah, there is no second step on this one. All right, so right now what we're going to do is take a look at deleting one file from multiple directories or uh, user home folders. Um, so first off, we're going to have to elevate permissions using <coughs> sudo command. Um, then we're going to be removing using the rm. And we're going into users. We're using the asterisk, which uh, represents basically a string um, that's going to allow you to access all the user folders that are, reside inside that user's folder. Yep. So all the user directories inside the user's folder. There we go. Um, then we're going to be accessing their library preferences, and we're removing the com.safari.plist. 
the asterisk is called a, a glob in Bash, and it actually expands out to match anything in the directory. So what Bash receives is the RM command with multiple arguments, uh, users, and then any directory in that, or any file or directory in that is then create, is added to an argument that with users, argument, library preferences, combat, safari, dot apple, and then there's a white space, and then it adds the next argument in. So each of those folders or files becomes an actual argument in the terminal. But for simplicity's sake, we can say that if you use the asterisk, you glob and get anything in that folder. Ooh. All right, so we're going to delete all files in a cache. Um, here we're using the uh, RM. Uh, the hyphen capital R uh, basically looks to remove all files located in that directory. If they are protected, you should get flagged, correct? Yes, if you right. try and remove from a protected location that you don't have right, access rights to, then it'll stop you. But in this instance, you're pulling from your home folder, so you'll have full rights to delete things. Absolutely. When you remove stuff from hey, a, uh, Just a second. Greg? <laughs> when you remove stuff from a folder, um, where does that end up going? If you delete stuff off your desktop, it normally goes into the trash. Right. When you use the RM command, what happens to that? that it basically removes the reference to the file, the inode file. So it's gone. There is no middle step. OK. OK, so um, how's everybody feeling with the terminal so far? Feeling good? Yeah, good, OK. Uh, we wanted to kind of give a couple little hints on using Google and some things that I use on a daily basis when I'm trying to find things to do in the terminal. And so when, I, when I'm looking for something to change, like my Safari preferences, my home page, and I want to do it through the terminal, I'll, I'll add in the terminal word. And that typically helps me find things that are based on the terminal. Um, sometimes I add OS 10 and Mac just to uh, help narrow those results down. Uh, there's also a couple sites that I use frequently. Uh, the default write site uh, could use some help from the community, but uh, you can submit your own default write commands. But there's a plethora of commands up there, too, listed by OS and by application, uh, a couple different categories. So it's really helpful to try and find commands that people have uh, uh, found and to share the commands that you've found with defaults. Uh, Apple Stack Exchange. I think we're all familiar with Stack Exchange from our Google results. The Apple Stack Exchange, of course, uh, has a lot of terminal help as well as system help, too. And then finally, hints.macworld.com, which has been around for a very long time and has been helping me with terminal commands since uh, 2004 or so. Um, so it's a great resource for you. Don't know the answer. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. All right, so more to the GUI. Actually, I think I still have a couple more. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're going to look at a software update command. Um, so if you do a software update uh, hyphen L, this should basically list all command or, uh, updates that would be available um, for your Mac. So it is going to actually go out and uh, troll, I'm guessing, what Apple's site. Apple's software updates catalog, and yep. the index. And, and so this is something that you might typically do through an, uh, the Apple software updates drop down or go into the Mac App Store and then check the updates tab. And then from there, you might click install and wait. Um, but doing it from the terminal here, we can just, uh, like Chris said, list out the software updates available. All right. so. Uh, if we want to do a software update hyphen D, this is going to download that file and, and this, uh, save it for a later install. Um, basically, these will also, this uh, flag or option um, can be followed by an argument, uh, whether that be, uh, let's see, what do we have here? Dash R for recommended. Um, so if it's a recommended Apple update, you'll see a little asterisk beside it in the list. Um, dash A. We'll do all, or we can actually specify by the specific name that's listed um, with the version number as well. And that's going to go for the next one, which is a software update dash I, which will actually install. So it'll download and install um, the update for you. 
And then the last thing you might want to take a look at would be uh, the dash dash schedule. Um, from there, we can set that up to be on or off. Um, that's the automatic update. So we can disable that or enable it if need be. Any questions? All right, Bueller. <clears throat> Installing software. All right, so this one, we're going to install a package that technically would be on the desktop, or we're going to pretend that it's on the desktop already, and that's a VLC version 2.2.4. Um, so we're running the installer command, uh, pulling a package, and we're targeting. Uh, so basically, it's going to run that package and install it where it should install, which would be your applications folder. Yeah, and with, with target, you know, you're typically pointing to that forward slash, the root of the booted volume that you're on. But if, you're, um, if you have an external disk of a machine that's in target disk mode or a master image, like a, gold, a golden master, you can target that volume itself, too, and install directly to that. Um, you have to be cautioned, though, because some installers will run scripts after they've installed files. And if they're not written properly, the scripts will run on the booted system and not the targeted system. So something to keep in mind. All right, so we're going to take a look at printing the last 100 lines of the install log to confirm success. We're going to use the tail command, uh, followed by a hyphen 100. So that's basically saying we're going to use the last 100 lines. Um, and we're, we're accessing the uh, var log directory. Um, var is actually a hidden directory, so it's very quite easy to access through terminal, not so easy to access through finder. I mean, you'd have to basically go into terminal to enable the, to be able to access it anyway, so why bother jumping back and forth? Just do it all here. Um, and the last one we're looking at here is waiting and monitoring the install process. So we're running the tail command with the uh, hyphen F option, which is going to basically allow tail to continuously look for data um, and then display that data as it becomes available. So uh, this would be a great way to uh, monitor the log instead of using the console.app. All right, getting system information. So many GUI processes we can take to the terminal. Uh, all right, so we're going to use the system profiler command. And there is an underscore between system and profiler on this one. Now, if that command, uh, it does print out a lot of data. And if you'd like to stop it in the middle of its printing, you can use the Control-C shortcut to interrupt it. Yep, memory and all processes. All right, so system profiler hyphen list data types. This is going to bring up a list of all the uh, various data types available through system profiler. Uh, so that's breaking it down to things like hardware, um, software, et software, et cetera. Networking. And this is helpful if you're just looking for a small piece of information out of system profiler and you don't want to print out all of the information available. You can narrow your results down to just what you're looking for. For example, let's say we need to get a serial number off a computer, right? <clears throat> we can run, oh, excuse me, bacon. System profiler, uh, we can run the SP hardware data type. We're going to pipe that to the awk command. Um, awk uh, basically searches for patterns. We're going to use the hyphen F option, which is looking for separators in those patterns, uh, followed by the actual serial number, right? The search term. The search yep. term, yep. And then we're going to print two. So we're going to print the two columns associated with that. Oops. One would be, well, we're going to print the second one of the two. First one would be serial number. We don't want that. We just want the actual number, which would be in the second column. And that's what you're, well, that's the output on the machine we ran this on. I hope your serial number is different. Otherwise, we might have an issue. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Not in the face, not in the face. <laughs> I was just curious if I could handle regular expressions instead of just like a text argument like there. That's a great question. Anyone know the answer? Regular expressions in awk? I'm not sure. Yes? Yes, it can. I hear yes. Yes, it can. Thanks. Great question. 
right. Okay, next up we're going to look at the find command. So instead of going into a spotlight or a finder search window, we can come into the terminal and use a find command. And the first argument after find is the path that you want to search in. So remember the tilde is our home folder. So we're looking inside of our home folder. The next uh, argument is the I name, and that is case insensitive name of a file. Uh, we're using the asterisk again to create a glob expression to say anything that starts with anything and ends with .sh. Those are the files that we're looking for. So the find command will search my home folder for any shell scripts with this command. Find also has some uh, time modification features. So we can use dash m time to look for files that have a modification time that's uh, greater than three days. So any file that I modify greater than three days ago. And I'm using a hyphen print zero. And what that does is it replaces a new line. So when we used find in the first uh, example, we got a printout of every file on a new line. And the print zero removes that new line character and replaces it with a null character. And the reason it does that is because we're passing it to xargs. That looks for that null character to separate those files. So with xargs, we can say hyphen zero, expect a null character as the separator. So print, zero, print minus print zero and minus zero, those are kind of complementary commands or arguments. And then with xargs, we say any, uh, any file, run this command against it. And in this case, it's rm. So this command deletes any files that are modified three days ago, not 30 days ago. There's a mistake. Uh, yes. If we did plus 30d, that would be 30 days ago. So we can also use um, the Spotlight's database and mdfind to search for some files as well. Uh, mdfind has an only in argument, which is similar to the finds uh, first parameter for the home folder. And only in, in our home folder, with a dash name of .sh, will find any file in my home that's a oh. shell script. Question about the uh, about our uh, our find and destroy command in the middle. Yes. Does that give output? Um, I'm trying to remember when we tested that if that gave output, and I want to say that it does not, because RM would not give output, okay. and XRGs when you pipe it pipes the output. Uh, a lot of output. You, did you get output from that? Okay. Um, hopefully, uh, I didn't really preface this very well that it would delete files, but I'm hopefully that you didn't run that on your system and delete a bunch of files from three days ago. <laughs> I, I, should pro I should put a warning there. <laughs> Disclaimer. Disclaimer, but it is early in the morning for me. RM slash star dot star. Don't, don't do that. Don't, yes, please don't. <laughs> I, I don't want to be the session that ruins the rest of your week. <laughs> Although I might be already. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Great question, though. Thank you. Um, so then uh, with mdefine, we can also use some additional metadata that the file system knows about with files. And in this case, we can ask it to look for an item content type that matches com.adobe.pdf which should return any PDF file within your home directory, which is a quite convenient command, especially if you're looking for a file, a specific file type. And so you might ask, how do I find file types for the files that I might want to search for? And the answer to that would be to use the mdls command and at, uh, pass it the argument of a file you'd like to know the content type for. Now this is a, a cut of what's actually printed out to make it easier to, to share with you, uh, but you'll get quite a lot of data when you do an MDLS on a file. Uh, if you look for that uh, KMD item content type, you can find exactly what type it is, and then you can use that within your MD find command to find 
files of the same type. Okay, we're talking about some preferences now. Uh, so one of the things you might want to do is watch the file system for a preference change so you can find a location of where the preference file exists. Um, this is, becomes less and less helpful as OS X moves more into managing pr uh, preferences on its own within databases, but for now we can still utilize this for some things. So the command uh, sudo we pass to make ourselves uh, root on the system, and we run fsusage, which is a file system usage command, with a hyphen w argument. And the hyphen w argument is the wide format for the output. And the reason we do this is because we want to see the, the path of the file from start to end, and without that wide argument, it gets truncated. Uh, we then pass those results to grep. And grep is a tool that will search uh, the line for a specific string and return the line if it, that string exists. So in this case, we're looking for a text wrangler string. So anything that happens through the file system with text wrangler will be returned. And then I, I pipe that right back into grep again with a hyphen i argument to make it a case insensitive search, and I look for plist. Use the hyphen i on the text wrangler search as well. Yeah. Technical question, is that? Oh, can I get a mic, Greg? Thanks. Uh, a technical question would be is uh, the syntax up there, text wrangler no space uh, pipe? Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, note. This syntax should work fine because uh, the shell understands that the pipe is a special character. Um, you shouldn't have any problem. Now, if I wanted the pipe to be a part of my file name, I would have to escape that with a backslash to say to the shell, don't expand, don't, don't respect that as a special character. Pretend it's a dumb character, or just a part of my string. So the spaces are slightly optional when you're piping things, but are typically good for just readability and uh, you're making sure that you haven't made a mistake there. But definitely, I encourage you to kind of play around with that and try it both ways and see what works best for you. Um, so this, if you can read it, is a, a sample of the output that I found with FS usage. And what we find here is we start with a little timestamp and we basically can ignore those. Um, and we've, what we see, there's a write data flag here. So the system is writing data. Uh, there are some other things that I'd like to ignore because I don't care about them. And then I find the path. So the last, last out part of this output is the path to the file that the data was written to. And so I can see that my users, home folder, library preferences, com.barebones.textwrangler.plist. Random strings was just written to. And the way that the CF preferences daemon works is it writes this temporary file first and then replaces the real file on the, on the system. So I'm seeing here um, the CF prefs daemon actually writing that file out after I've changed a preference in text wrangler. Now the, the real benefit to seeing that is being able to find the domain of this file. Okay, so I, f I know that com dot barebones dot text wrangler is kind of the preference domain that text wrangler, text wrangler writes to. And because I know that then, I can also write to that domain using the defaults command. Actually, in this case, I'm reading from that domain. And this is really the safest way to go when you're working with preferences because the defaults command works within the uh, CF preferences daemon and it doesn't read directly from a file. Um, CF preferences sometimes caches, changes to a preference and doesn't write it to file. So you, you may have some weirdness if you're looking directly at a file, but using the defaults and the uh, domain of the preference, you're uh, insured to return the preferences. And in this case, I'm looking for my username. Now, if I want to update that username, I can use the defaults write command and the domain again. And then the, uh, the key that I'd like to update and the value that I'd like to put in here. So in this case, it's a string. So I've quoted the spider, and that'll become the username. Uh, these are really great to know if you want to create profiles, because you can take the commands that you've learned here, find the domain, look at the domain, find the key, find what sort of value it's supposed to be, and then with that, those pieces of data, 
you can then make a configuration profile for your systems. Uh, I suggest that more than I suggest writing directly to preference files when you're doing deployments, but of course you have some options there. Okay, any questions on those? Great. So we're going to work now on combining all of this code we've been working on into a script and actually doing something with it. So, editing a script. There are very, uh, a very wide variety of tools we can use to edit a script, and a lot of it depends on what you're familiar with, what you like, and some of the features that are involved with them. Um, so off the bat, you know, in Terminal we've got Nano, we've got VI. These are very good text editors through the command line. Uh, and it's beneficial to know at least one of these so that if you have to remote into a system using Secure Shell or sit down and quickly edit a file that you need root access to, these command line editors can make that a real breeze. But, you know, we like GUIs sometimes. So there are text editors like Atom from uh, GitHub and Text Wrangler that can help you build scripts and write them in a more uh, GUI fashion. One of the nice things about Atom and Text Wrangler is that they've got some tab completion for uh, complex commands like if statements, for loops, while loops, functions, etc. So if you type in if in Text Wrangler and you hit tab, you'll get the structure of the if command completed for you where you just have to type in some small bits. We'll see more of that later. Uh, the other thing that's really nice about some of these GUI text editors is the command to run a script. There's a keystroke that you can use to test your code. And as long as it doesn't need pseudo writes, as long as it's not asking for a parameter to be passed to it when you run it, these things are very nice for checking a script quickly. So, if you'd all like to open up a text editor of your choice, um, we can create a script. And feel free to walk through with us here. Um, the first part of the script is the shebang. So we have a pound sign and an explanation point. And that's the shebang of the script. And then we give it the path to the command line interpreter we want to run. And in this case, bin bash. So this is our bash script. Should we throw out the disclaimer that this is going to wipe their machine clean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next thing we see <laughs> is a pound, pound sign with a space. And a pound sign, uh, it, as the first character of a line, is a comment. So the shell will ignore this line. We can put whatever we'd like after that pound sign. It's great for commenting. So in this, we're doing a comment that this is a basic script. And then we see our old friend Echo again here, echoing hello world. Okay, so this is a very simple script. When we run the script, the command interpreter will say this is a bin bash script. And it'll pass it off and say, OK, I don't need to care about line two because it's a comment. OK, I need to care about line three. What am I supposed to do? Passes echo in with its argument of hello world and then outputs it to the screen. So shall we see that in action by running a script? Well, you won't see it here. You'll have to do it on yours. But what you'll have to do first is if you're in the terminal and once you save that file, you'll want to change your directories to where that file was saved. You may still be there if it was on the desktop and you were uh, changing to the desktop earlier. But once you change to where that file is, you have to tell it to be executable. By default, your files are not executable when you create them, and that's by uh, security design. We don't want all of your files to be executable. It's just silly. But for it's a script, dangerous. yes, it's dangerous. But for a script, we want it to be executable. So our chmod command takes uh, an argument of u plus x, and u plus x means for the user portion of the permissions add, executes. And then the last argument is the script that we want to effect with this change. There's another way to do this too where you can specify an argument for all permissions of the file. And when I say permissions, I mean POSIX permissions, just to be clear. 755 will set read, write, and execute for the owner and then read and write for the group and for everyone else. So Everyone can read your file, but only you can execute this, this script. Once you've added execute permission to the file, you can then call bin bash and the name of the script. So we're calling, directly calling bash, and we're giving it the single argument of script.sh. And this will print out hello world, as long as that's what you typed in. 
You can also, if you're in the same directory as the script, use a dot, forward slash, and then fill this, uh, complete with the name of the script, and that will tell the interpreter to run that script as well. And finally, you can give a full path to the script to run it to. Any questions on running a script? Great. OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit about automating some of these things through Bash. Our first example is date and time. One of the things that we do initially when we set up systems is we had gone into system preferences and date and time and made sure that our time zone was correct. Well, with a script, we can add in, starting with the first line of bin bash, system setup dash set time zone, the first argument, and then the time zone we want to set it to, so America, New York. After that, we want to tell it to turn on using uh, the network time server, NTP. And we set the NTP server to clock.psu.edu. At that point in my script, I echo out the network has been configured, and the network time has been configured, and the script ends at this point. So assuming all of my commands have worked properly, I get to the end, it echoes it out, and then from the command line, the only thing you see, uh, besides any error messages or possible output from the other commands, is the echo. The last line will be echo network time configured, and your script is run successfully. Any questions on the network time scripts? Okay. The other script we're going to talk about is the in install, install. Uh, <laughs> Instead, yeah, yeah. get it? Instead, it? software. You had the question? Uh, Sorry. That's all right. I just wanted to find out how can you address multiple times, uh, multiple time servers if you have, just in case one is not there? Gotcha. Um, so, uh, com comma? Okay, so this gentleman said comma, the, t the time zones. So if we go back here. Time server, so it, time servers, yeah. Um, yeah, it, the network time servers, it's possible if you add a comma there or a space. Um, I would look at the man page. If you do man system setup, that'll tell you how to add additionals. Comma, it's comma, okay. Comma, additionals. Okay, so installing software. Again, we start our first line off with that shebang, bin bash to tell it which interpreter to use. And the first line I'm going to use, use here is a curl command. curl hyphen o forward slash temp forward slash office 2016.company.pkg. Now, don't write this down because it won't work anyway. But the first argument here is the output. So curl is hyphen o outputting to this file. Okay, So if it doesn't exist, it'll start writing to it. And then the second argument is the address to pull that file down from. So if you have a web server with a package, you can curl down that package from the web server using it. And then using the installer command that we saw before, we can uh, pass our argument to the package and the target. Now we know where we've downloaded that file. It's in temp. And, and uh, by all assumptions, because curl is completed successfully, we're here and we're ready to install. So this is a very quick way instead of having to mount a file server and, down, and move your packages to the desktop and then install them, you can store them on a web service, curl them down, and install them very quickly. Now, this works very well for one package, you say. What happens if I have multiple packages that I want to use this with? Well, I have an answer for you, I would say. And I would say, <laughs> curl down multiple files first, using the same command over and over, hyphen O out to temp, out to temp. It doesn't matter how many times you do this. You can do this 100 times because we can use a for loop. And we can say for my package in temp glob.pkg. Now we've seen our, our fancy asterisk glob again. Now if we remember, what glob does is it takes any file that it matches in this directory and creates a, an expansion of that. So we end up with passing into the for loop temp package perfect software company package, because there's always a piece of perfect software. 
and coupon.company.package because somebody inevitably wants that coupon printer. And that becomes two arguments here for the for loop. And then we address each of those arguments using a variable called dollar sign my package. And we can see those are in quotes. That's to make sure that if you put any spaces in your package or special characters, that it doesn't mess up. And basically what we're going to do here is we're going to install the first package to the target. We're going to install the second package to the target. It's going to loop through there twice. And then we're done. And that will install both of those packages one after another. Any question on installing software? All right. We do this right now in production. We copy down files, not from a web service, but from another location. We run a for loop. This is very nice because if we, if we add any files in there, we don't have to list out the name and say install. We just say anything that's a package in this directory, install it. All right, we talked a little bit about changing preferences earlier, but we're going to talk a little bit more about doing that within a script. So we've got our first line, our bin bash again. And our second line here is a list of domains. Now you can see uh, the dollar sign in front of this. That should not be there if it's a script, but it should be there. If you, this is kind of the example from a command line as well. So if you write in domains equals with quotes and write in each of those domains, and remember we had a text wrangler and a Python, or I'm sorry, text wrangler before, com.barebones.textwrangler. Mm -hmm. These are the com.microsoft.products, so Outlook. Word, PowerPoint, Excel. And for each of these domains, we want to make a change. So what you might want to do if you're not using preferences is Wait use a for loop, again, to say for, for the i, i is the reference to each individual domain in that list. So for i in the dollar sign domains. Now, does anyone know why we don't have quotes over the domains here? Okay, good, you're in the right room if you don't know. The reason we don't have quotes is because we want the domains, the spaces between domains to be respected in the for loop. If we put quotes around the dollar sign domain, it passes it as a single string with spaces. And then it for loop says, this is one argument. I don't, and then it passes it to whatever command you have and then every hell breaks loose. So we leave the quotes off the dollar sign domain here to say don't quote these spaces, and that becomes one, two, three, four, five separate arguments passed to the for loop. So with each of these arguments, I'm going to write a preference change. So defaults write dollar sign i. So let's say outlook in this instance. And then the preference key k sub ui app completed first run setup 1507. Thank you, Microsoft. <laughs> Boolean dash booleans, this is a true or false flag. So instead of just a quote for a string, we say this is a boolean, and we want it to be true. So this will go through all the preferences for Office uh, suite packages and set the first run setup as done. So you should not see that preference file. Uh, this was stolen from, I mean, uh, referenced from macops.ca, <laughs> disabling first run dialog in Office 2016 for Mac. It's a great resource. It's not stolen, it's shared. It's, yes. It's brilliantly shared with all of you. Any questions on for loops or defaults rights? Defaults is a fun command to play with. I think I have one build remaining. Oh, yes, and then done. So we have to remember to close our for loop with a done command. And that, that tells the loop to continue back at the top. Okay. So we've used a variable a couple times here, but let's talk a little more about what they are and how to use them in your code. Um, quotes. So as we talked about, double quoting will escape special characters like the dollar sign, I'm sorry, won't escape the dollar sign, backslashes, or back, uh, single quotes, uh, back ticks, sorry, back ticks or backslashes, dollar signs. But it escapes everything else. Um, dollar sign escapes the next character outside of a, uh, quotes. So if you have something like uh, a, a bar, uh, a, a pipe that you want to escape, you don't want the shell to respect that to move to the next command, you can escape that. You said dollar sign. Uh, yeah, backslash. Thank you. 
Uh, single quotes then escape everything. So everything inside a single quote, none of it's looked at by the shell. T uh, treats it as a single string. Uh, and typically the internal file separator, so the thing that we've been talking about separating between commands and arguments is called the internal file separator, and that's white space. That's a space, pretty much. So echo dollar sign PWD. And feel free to try this as we go along. This is going to be echoing out the environment variable PWD, which should be your current working directory. If we put quotes, double quotes around that, the shell says, I understand what double quotes are. I'll take this dollar sign and expand it to the variable that you want. Very nice, shell. Thank you. We get user students, or whatever your username is. But what happens if we use single quotes? And then the shell says, I'm not looking in there. And you get dollar sign PWD as your echo. And finally, the backslash. If you use that backslash in front of that dollar sign, the shell says, I'm going to ignore it and treat it like a string. And you get your dollar sign PWD. Quoting is fun. If you get into bash scripting, I'll apologize now for quotes. It'll be hell at certain points. Uh, just keep playing with it. Ask. Any questions on quotes? All right, they're almost as fun as the defaults command. Not so much a question as a comment, but. Awesome. Uh, or both, I guess. Anyway, how do you deal with, what's a good way to deal with smart quotes? Like if you found the recipe online and yeah. you paste it in, you can sometimes get some real funny results. Yes, you can. I hate smart quotes. And you've, you've probably seen a couple in these slides because of that issue. Um, <laughs> so you can try turning smart quotes off, but you'll still get them in a copy and paste. And so what I like to do once my system has smart quotes turned off is the command option shift V paste. Command option shift V paste the text using the format of whatever you're pasting into. So if you're pasting into the terminal, that might get rid of those smart quotes. Um, the other thing to do would be to paste it into a text editor that is a plain text editor, like our Atom or Text Wrangler, and manually switch the quotes. That's a, unfortunately as far as I've gotten with that. Yes, luckily I, don't, I haven't had to deal with those too much, but I, I felt your pain. Uh, smart quotes are not great. I don't even think they look that pretty either. Like, I don't understand why your people, oh, never mind. Tangent. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little more about variables. Let's create a variable. Now you can do this straight from the command line, or you can put this into a script. Either way, this will work. And that's one of the things that we're, I hope that we're getting across without actually saying it is the things that we're showing you in the terminal work inside a shell script, and the things that work inside a shell script work inside the terminal. So you can play in one place, develop in another, vice versa. Um, so in this, we're creating a new message variable. Message equals quote, quote, hello. So that's our message. And then we have an ending. Ending is quote, world, quote, and if we echo both of these things, we get the friendly hello world again. Now you can see that when we're referencing variables, we're using the dollar sign. When we're creating variables, uh, if it's not clear, this dollar sign here is what the terminal prints out with a space, and then the command actually starts here, with message equals. Okay, so do we all see that in the terminal, the dollar sign? Probably see a host name or something there too. Uh, you can change that if you'd like, but uh, for now, just to get that across. Echo, dollar sign, message will reference the variable. No dollar sign will set the variable. And then if you'd like, you can look at all the built-in environmental variables using the env command. And this is uh, where we see the user and the pwd. These things are set by the system when you log in or move directories. So a very quick thing to do might be to echo the user and the home folder that they're using. Some place you might use this is in maybe an inventory or reporting script where you want to know the user that's on the system and their home folder of the, of the current person logged in. Okay. 
So now we're going to talk about going from outputs to variables. So taking your output and doing different things with them. Um, we can create a new variable with a command using the dollar sign and parentheses. Preference, parentheses. Thank you. <laughs> Preferences. So the date command is a new command for us. If you type in date, you get an output of today's date. Well, last week's when we made these slides. <laughs> um, and so this is great. But we might want this as part of a script to keep track of when the script ran. Might want to echo the date out into a log file, something like that. Um, and we might want to do that multiple times. So what we can do is we can turn date into a today variable. So we say today equals dollar sign, parentheses, and then the command, date. That takes the output of date and puts it directly into the today variable. Yeah? So then if we echo today, we get roughly the same thing. Now, date is run once in this instance and is set into the today variable. So the date will not change in the today variable. If I waited five minutes, and echo today again, it would be the same 21, 28 time. Yes? Do you know the, oh. Hello? There we go. Do you know what the difference is between that and the, like, the little ticks? The, the back, back ticks? ticks? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I don't know the specific like underlying differences, but it's a, it's a, uh, superseded way of doing it, kind of. The, the back ticks are kind of the old, you know the answer to this? Yeah. Here. That's what I love about this conference. Somebody in the room knows the answer. So when you put it in the parentheses with a dollar sign, it actually creates a subshell and runs it in, a, in its own kind of environment, so to speak, whereas the back ticks just kind of say, run this and come back. Perfect. Thank you. I did not know that. Um, what the, the reason I got to use the dollar sign parentheses was because it was newer than the back ticks, and so I've just done it because it works. But that's an important thing to realize, is when you're running a subshell, um, things can sometimes be different in the subshell than what you've set in the main shell. Um, and so if you're having weirdness, try back ticks, see if that works. Um, and just so, so, because we're not referencing the back ticks, let me explain that. Uh, instead of the dollar sign parentheses, you would do a back tick in the front and a back tick in the back. Yeah? One thing to add, One thing to add yeah. Do you want to try and catch it? Uh, that's a bad idea. Too, many, too many water, yeah. coffees. Too many, too many and coffee. yeah. I'm not, I don't want to replace any. So one thing about the subshell, specifically if you want to take a variable and you want to set the variable to an output of a function, uh, you have to use a subshell to do that. You can't just use the back ticks. Okay, great, thank you. Oops. Okay. So here's an example of how you might want to uh, use this. And so uh, we can look at the Mac model using System Profiler and the SP hardware data type. And when that prints out, we can awk again for the model identifier and print the third result from that. And that returns something like iMac 11.2 or MacBook Pro 5.1. Uh, are we all familiar with those types of identifiers? We can see those in system preferences when you get a full system report. Um, those are very helpful sometimes when you're looking at recycling systems, you know how old the system is from them. Uh, in this case, we want to know whether this is a MacBook or an iMac or Mac Pro or some other desktop. So we can use an if command, and we can use if, left bracket, left bracket, and then in quotes, the Mac model that we just set in that variable above. And we can use the equals equals to say, with the asterisk, if, this, if the word book is inside the Mac model variable, then this is true. We should do something with it. So in this case, we say this is a portable. Okay, if it's not, we give it Nothing. You say nothing happens. So only if this system is a portable do we do anything. You can add an else command in there between echo, this is a portable, and the, the fi command, and do something else. You can say else 
do something else. But in this case, we're just saying this is a portable. This is else, this is a desktop. Else, this is a desktop. Okay. Any questions on that? We move on to catching errors. If statements are fun, there's a lot of built-in checks for if statements. If you do a search for them, uh, existence of files and directories and other things, that will be very helpful. Okay, so catching errors. Um, when a shell command runs, you get an exit status from it. And uh, so this is a script that we have called script.sh. And the contents of it, when I do cat script, it, we see the bin bash line on line one. We see an echo error on line two. And then we see an exit command. And the exit command exits this uh, subshell with this value of two. So when we run this script, it creates a subshell runs the script, and then returns back to us the number 2 as our exit value. Now, we don't see this. All we see is the echo of the error. That's what we want, right? That's the only thing we told it to tell us, at least. But if we use the dollar sign question mark, we can actually see the value of the exit. So we can see here we exited 2. So how is this helpful for you? Well, let's say you're inside a script, and this is a very complex script, and there's lots of things going on, like erasing disks. Yeah, and sometimes erasing disks doesn't work out like you'd like it to. Sometimes the disk doesn't erase. Sometimes your disk doesn't exist, or it's not in the place you thought it was. And so if we use the exit value, um, echo parentheses dollar, or echo dollar sign question mark to get that value and put it into a variable called exit value, then we can run echo printing it out, and we can run if statements, checking it. So we can say if it's greater than zero, where zero is a successful run, no errors, anything above that's going to be an error. If it's greater than zero, we need to notify ourselves, hey, disk utility didn't work. And if you're relying, if the rest of your script relies on that command to do something properly, then you want to exit out of this script because it didn't do it right and you can't move on. Now, if it did com complete successfully, you might just want to say, hey, yep, we're good. Nice little logging, echo, we're good, move on, Bye. Any questions on that? All right. Uh, and and or. So when we're running commands, the shell has a couple of and and or uh, shortcuts. So the, uh, the two pipes, pipe pipe, is sort of the or command here. We can say uh, if disk utility erase disk, disk one fails, if it doesn't complete successfully, then use OSA script to do a beep. Now, OSA script is the command line equivalent of Apple script. So we're running an Apple script command here. And we say the Apple script command is a beep. And that just beeps our machine. Very nice beep. OK. so. What happens if uh, you want to do something when a command completes successfully? So in this case, we use MC extra profile. And this takes a preference file and outputs it to a mobile config file. And so I point to my earlier example, the bare bones text wrangler plist. And I out that, output that to an RZM 102 text wrangler file. Um, if you'll notice the backslash here, there is a new line here. So there's a return. And the backslash escapes the return to say, hey, I'm not done writing my command yet. I still got more. Hold on. But because it was a, a long line to list here, we put that in. So if you copy and paste it from the slides, it'll work. But if you're typing it out, you can skip that backslash and return and just hit and and. So and two ampersands here will say, if the first command completes successfully, then run the second command. So in this case, I've created my profile. It worked. It's created on my desktop. Now we can SCP it, uh, uh, secure copy it, or to another server. So in this case, I, the first argument is the path to the local file. And the second argument is the username at the server, and then a colon, and then the, the full path to the location on the server that I want this. So maybe I'm automating creating profiles and copying them to a web server for storage, or to a file server. It looks like what you're doing. It looks like what I'm doing. OK. So um, when we're writing code, uh, uh, I make mistakes all the time. 
And one of the things that I like to use is ShellCheck. And ShellCheck is a website, but it's also a plugin uh, for at least for Atom uh, text editor, but probably for some others as well. And the shell check will look at your code and it'll give you some warnings. It'll tell you where some errors are. It'll tell you if there's a variable that you haven't used. It's very helpful for when you're starting to pick up those little tiny, you know, bad quote, missing space, little things that you spend hours and hours looking for. This guy will help you find them. So it's pretty cool. I suggest checking it out. Yes. Uh. So does that plug in for Adam, does that just go out to the website or does that, uh, I'm just wondering if it'd be a workaround for not being able to put that kind of stuff out mm -hmm. on a, to a public website? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if the, the plug in for the Adam text editor is like a complete solution or if it just pushes out to the website. My, if I had to guess, probably pushes out to the website, yeah. Okay, so um, I've been using Atom a lot. It's got a lot of great plugins. Um, it's got a remote edit plugin where you can set up a server and a SSH into that server, edit a file, but you're doing it through your GUI locally. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can run, command, run your script right here and see the output. Um, and it's got some great color to it so we can help find the parts of your script with color. I like it. Okay. So questions, any questions? It's uh, anything about the conference, or the session? Okay, uh, any, anything you want to script? Do you want to see anything scripted? Live demos, tempt the gods, no, yes. So this may be a little beyond the scope of this particular session, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I was wondering if you would talk a minute or two about parameter expansion and about some do's and don'ts. Um, oh, parameter expansion. Um, so are you talking about like... Um, well, I'm, I'm talking about specifically, you know, specifically where I run into issues with it if I'm setting variables to long strings that have spaces or special characters. The escape keys work differently and weird and sometimes you do quotes and sometimes you don't do quotes and it just, it seems like a random behavior. Yeah, yeah, and um, it, it definitely does seem like that. Quoting is probably one of the harder things to get used to um, and it's something that I just, I can constantly play with until I get it right. Um, so, so for like parameter expansions, when we're talking about um, using wildcards and things like that, um, the asterisks to go about things or uh, regular expressions, you typically want to put those into double quotes because the shell will interpret those things with inside of them. And so what I'd like to do is uh, try and break them down into variables and have a variable with smaller strings and then start combining those variables in. But sometimes, again, that can get a little crazy because you don't know whether or not to quote the second variables or do you quote them as a single string or a single quote each variable. Um, so unfortunately, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to have to fall back on the it depends kind of thing. And, and if there was a specific example, we could you know, drop out to the terminal and play around. Yeah, we might can catch up offline or something and look at it. But Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that, I, yeah that's a fun one. All right, thanks. Um, any, any other scripting questions? Hello again. Hey. Uh, how have you found is a good way to get interactive input? Oh, interactive input, yeah. So you're running a script and you want the user to enter something. Um, like, for example, I want to rename a computer and someone has to put in their username or okay. something like that. Yeah. So I, I typically try and avoid something like a username because I, I don't want to know. They, they'll make a mistake, right? Uh, probably typing it in. I'll make a mistake typing it in. So I try and use a variable in all cases. But when I need input from the user, um, I would have to ask the question, are we running this script from the command line? Is this a user that's going to be starting it from the command line? Or are we wrapping the script into like an app to run? And so with the command line, you can use something like read. And read will take an input and put it into a variable name. So if you do may, I think read might be a built-in variable. So you probably want to do a Google search on that because you won't get a, anything with man read. That's a great way to do it. 
Now, if you want to get a little more advanced and you want to get a little nicer of an input dialog, things like Coco Dialog or AppleScript can be used to prompt the user for an input. What's really nice about AppleScript is that you can do a lot of additional things like uh, turning the text into asterisks. Now, you can do this on the command line too with read, but it's a couple additional steps. Um, and uh, AppleScript allows you to just do that with a flag. So you prop up, prop to, uh, do the AppleScript prompt, add the hidden text flags or whatever it is, and then that, whatever is entered into that uh, text field, you put into a variable. Welcome. Okay. Um, questions? I'm going to run this quick uh, Mackinac shell script. Oh, look at that. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Well, I wonder what the exit status of that shell script was. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I noticed that one of the scripts that we ran, uh, we called the script directly. Yes. And I've also noticed, uh, just working on my own, that you can use uh, sh to uh, run a script. What's okay. the difference when? Great question. So sh is a uh, um, the sh it, it, I forget the exact name. I think it's uh, the shell. I think it's just like the sh, sh is shell. Bash is born again shell, B-A-S-H. So S-H is another command line, or another interpreter, um, and Bash has just some additional features built on top of shell. I can't tell you what the differences are off the hand, but that's pretty much the only difference. Um, they both work, and typically shell and Bash are going to be pretty agnostic between the two. If you start getting into other shells like corn shell, K-S-H, things like that, there are some crazy things that are going to be different. But stick with S-H or Bash, you'll be fine. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming.